The network layer provides end-to-end -end delivery of data, but machines typically have multiple applications running at the same time. How can I ensure the email that I'm sending doesn't get picked up by the web server application on the receiving end? This is the job of the transport layer, to direct traffic to specific applications or devices. There are two main protocols used on the transport layer, Transmission Control Protocol, or TCP, and User Datagram Protocol, or UDP. The protocol data unit for a TCP connection is called the segment, and for UDP, it is the datagram. We'll start off with the User Datagram Protocol, or UDP, as it is simpler. The header contains four fields, source port, destination port, length, and checksum. The logical port, shortened to port, is used by both TCP and UDP. It reflects the address that a program can lease as long as it's running. Since it has 16 bits, there are two to the 16 possible ports broken up into three categories. The first category is in the range from 0 to 1023, known as well-known ports. Well-known ports are reserved for system processes. You should avoid using these ports in your application unless you're building a client or server for those protocols. On Unix, accessing these ports requires super user privileges. The next and largest range of ports is the register ports. These start at 1024 and end at 49,151. Register ports are more flexible. There are no specific restrictions with choosing to use a port in this range. You only need to be careful of what other major software also uses that port. It is fine to overlap with other software as long as you don't anticipate your users using that software at the exact same time as yours. There's a Wikipedia entry for common software and their port usage that I've linked to in the transcript appendix as reference. Finally, we have the ephemeral ports in the range of 49,152 to 65,535. These are temporary ports automatically leased to applications by your operating system to be used for response type messages. Imagine there are two machines, A and B, both hosting web servers on port 80 with different content. If A opens a web browser, a different application, to visit B's website, that request, whether it be TCP or UDP, should have two port values. What are they? Destination port is easy. That will be port 80 as I'm trying to communicate with machine B's web server, which is hosted on port 80. Your first guess for the source port might also be port 80. But if we use source port 80, there's a conflict with the web server running on machine A. In fact, using any fixed port will be problematic as it's increasingly common to visit two or more sites at the same time. For example, watching a YouTube video while doing homework. What actually happens is that when our client makes the request, the operating system will automatically lease it in available ephemeral ports. This is set to be the source port. When we get a response back, the operating system forwards the data to our application, then releases its hold to that ephemeral port. This allows our browser to make multiple requests to different servers, and the timing in which I get my responses back no longer matters as they each have their own ephemeral port. Next, we are going to take a detour back to the network layer because something didn't make 100% sense and I couldn't explain it without knowledge of ports. In the network layer discussion, I mentioned that when you purchase internet service for your home, you're leasing a single IP address. But how would that work if my home had multiple devices? If the single external IP address is shared between multiple machines, how does my router know what device to route traffic to? This is solved using network address translation, or NAT. NAT is a technique that combines reserved local IP address space, for example, in the 192.168.0.0/16 range, and overloading ports to allow a single IP address to be shared among multiple devices. Let's consider an example where two devices, A and B, both on a home network, sharing a single external IP address, 200.1.1.1, are visiting the same website at 208.65.153.238. Both machines are assigned a local IP address by the router. A has the IP address 192.168.0.5, and B has the IP address 192.168.0.6. 
consider a single packet from A to the website. The router will see the local address 192.168.0.5 is owned by machine A. It will then rewrite the contents of the packet using the least IP address 201.1.1.1 and a new port number in the ephemeral range. But it will keep a record of all the original values stored in what we call a NAT table. In this example, the first row in the table underneath contains the rewritten data. It contains the original source IP address, 192.168.0.5, the original source port, 61202, the rewritten IP address, which is the external one, which is 200.1.1.1, and the rewritten source port, which is 63100. As the router is in charge of rewriting port numbers for all devices on the network, it can guarantee unique port numbers be assigned to each device. As the responses come back, the router undoes this rewriting process using a lookup from the NAT table, this time on the destination IP and port. In this example, upon receiving a response from 208.65.153.238, the destination IP and destination port are looked up inside of our NAT table, so 200.1.1.1 and 63,100 are looked up to find the original IP address and the original port. We then rewrite the packet to use the original values before forwarding it back onto our local network. As an exercise, trace what occurs when B sends a packet to the same IP address, 208.65.153.238. Show to yourself that multiple devices can share a single IP address thanks to NAT. This is also why if you get your IP banned from some website, it's effectively banned for your entire household, or at least until you lease a new IP address from your ISP by turning your router off for a few hours. Or you can tether to your phone, which will likely have its own IPv6 address. NAT works fine for most applications, but requires that your machine makes the first request. What if you want to accept incoming connections without first sending out a request? For example, if you're running a mail, or a web server, or a BitTorrent client. You can do this using port forwarding. You need to do a bit of additional configuration from within your router to set this up. To set up port forwarding, you essentially need to reserve a port on your router and tie it to a specific computer and can optionally change the ports. For example, setting all incoming traffic on port 443 to be forwarded to the IP address 192.168.0.5. In the example above, we use domain names instead of IP addresses, but we have a single gateway that accepts outside traffic from the internet on ports 443 and 444 and forwards them to devices on our internal network. All of these devices can share a single external IP address. A socket is an instantiation of a port number that can communicate with the outside world. When a port is opened, a socket has been created. A port number is only an address. To be able to send and receive data, our application must explicitly tell the operating system it wants to open a socket on that port number. This is also used for security reasons. For example, we can open a socket on port 12345 in order to allow network traffic to our application. We will come back to UDP later, but let's introduce TCP. Transmission Control Protocol, or TCP, provides reliable, ordered, and error-checked delivery of a stream of bytes between applications running on hosts communicating via an IP network. The protocol data unit of a TCP connection is called a segment. In order to make all these guarantees, the trade-off we pay is a much larger header size. The most common TCP header size is 20 bytes, which includes the first five rows in the above diagram. There's also quite a bit of overhead when using TCP to send and receive messages, as each segment of data must be acknowledged, requiring another 20 byte header from the receiving end. Next, let's look at the structure of the TCP header. The first row contains the destination port, which is the port that the traffic is intended for, as well as the source port, 
which is the port that the reply should be directed to. The fields after that are the sequence number and the acknowledgement number, which are 32-bit fields used together to guarantee the delivery of our data. The fourth row starts off with the data offsets, which indicates where the data begins, which is necessary because the TCP header format is not guaranteed to be 20 bytes. The options fields can extend it. After that, we have a few reserve bits, followed by TCP flags, which are used to categorize our segments. After the flags, we have a window size. This is used for congestion control and tells the sender how much data in bytes this device can receive at one time. This information is first exchanged during the initial connection handshake, and the value updates throughout the life of the connection as the device gets more or less congested. Following that, we have the checksum, which provides data integrity. Personally, I don't think this data integrity is necessary since the data link layer also provides it, but there are counter arguments that can be found on the web. Finally, we have the urgent pointer, which was intended to allow segment priority, uh, but has been since mostly obsoleted. There are also optional fields placed inside of options. These contain things like maximum segment size, window scaling, selective acknowledgement, and timestamps, which are less important to us. There are eight or nine TCP flags, depending on which version of TCP that we're currently looking at, six of which are important to us. The ACK flag stands for acknowledgement, and it tells the receiver that the acknowledgement number should be inspected. The push flag tells the receiver to push the currently buffered data to the application on the receiving end as soon as possible. We will learn about buffers in the next lesson, but a very quick primer is that as data flows into our system, bit by bit, that information is temporarily stored in a buffer until it reaches a minimum chunk size. The push flag allows us to signal to receiver to override this behavior and send data to the application right away. The reset flag is used to signal that one of the sides of the TCP connection hasn't been able to recover from a series of missing or malformed segments and to restart the connection entirely. The syn or synchronized flag is only used when first establishing a TCP connection and tells the receiving end to inspect the sequence number for synchronization purposes. We also have the fin flag, which is only used during a connection termination, and it signals that one side wants to close a connection. Finally, we have the urgent flag, which is obsolete nowadays, but it was originally intended to be used with the urgent pointer to signal that a segment had priority. In a TCP connection, there are four primary types of segments. A synchronization segment used when first establishing a connection. This is denoted with the syn flag. A data segment used to encode a chunk of data, and this has no special flag. An acknowledgment used to indicate data was received. This has the act flag. And a finish segment used to indicate a request to terminate a connection. This is denoted by the fin flag. A connection is initially established with a three-way handshake. One device, this can be either the sender or receiver, initiates a synchronization request. Upon receiving the synchronization request, the other device sends back a SYNAC. And finally, the original receiver acknowledges the receipt of the SYNAC with an ACK of its own. We then reach a socket state called established on both sides, where we can start sending data. The sender can then send data up to the receiver's window size, typically in segments of up to 65,000 bytes. Each segment includes a sequence number representing the order of bytes sent relative to all other messages. The sender then waits for acknowledgement packets. As it receives these segments, it begins sending data starting from the largest acknowledgement number received, sending up to the window size again to ensure the receiver is not overwhelmed with data. If the sender receives an acknowledgement with the same acknowledgement number two or more times, there was likely some data loss, and it will resend segments starting from the largest acknowledgement number received after waiting one round trip time, or RTT. This is used to collect additional duplicate acts. 
If the sender does not get a response within the request timeout or RTO timeframe, it resends every segment starting from the largest acknowledgement number. On the receiving end, after the three-way handshake has established the connection, the receiver waits for data segments containing sequence numbers. For each segment received in the correct order, it responds back with an act segment containing the acknowledgement number, which is set to be equal to the received sequence number plus the data length. This acknowledgement number indicates the next expected sequence number. If a segment is received with a sequence number larger than the current acknowledgement number, a segment is likely to have been lost or delayed. We store the new out-of-order segment in memory. We send an acknowledgement with the acknowledgement number set to be the missing segment's expected sequence number. This will signal to the sender to resend starting from this segment. Storing the previous segment will allow the receiver to jump back to the later acknowledgement number once the missing packet has been filled in. To terminate connection, we use a four-way closing handshake. This can be initiated by either party. One device, either the sender or receiver, initiates a four-way closing handshake by sending a FIN request to the other. The other side sends back an acknowledgement indicating that the closed request was received and begins the process of releasing resources before terminating the connection. This may take time if we need to close a database connection or perform garbage collection. Once the local shutdown of the socket is near completion, a FIN request is sent to the other side. An acknowledgement for the last FIN is sent, and upon receiving it, the socket is closed and the port number is returned to the operating system. TCP operates in duplex. We can send and receive data at the same time. There are two sets of sequence and acknowledgement numbers, one on each side of the connection. Inside of TCP, we have congestion control mechanisms. The receiver can tell the sender to speed up or slow down the transmission rate by adjusting the window size. This adjusts how many packets the sender can send without waiting for an acknowledgement. Since this value can't go above 65,535 due to the size of the header, for modern applications, there's a TCP option called TCP window scale that works as a multiplier for this value, allowing connection speeds of up to one gigabyte. Because every segment needs to be acknowledged inside of TCP, it has quite a bit of overhead. We may encounter a scenario called silly window syndrome, where we have a very small payload, but we have very large headers attached to it. Applications that do not require a 100% reliable data stream may use the user datagram protocol or UDP instead. There are no guarantees of any kind, but there is also no need for acknowledgement segments. If data is lost or corrupted, there is no built-in way to recover the lost data. It is up to the layer above it to perform any error recovery necessary to keep the application from failing entirely. It is useful in situations where some data loss is okay. For example, in video streaming, loss of packets can cause artifacting of a video, in voice over IP, it can cause distortion of voices, and in online multiplayer games, it can cause latency or lag for all players, the programming of which is typically referred to as netcode or lag compensation. It is the reason when playing multiplayer games online, a character may seem to teleport a bit when someone experiences lag. Instead of disconnecting the player on data loss, the game server can sometimes make some assumptions based off the player's current direction, velocity, and other previous inputs, and will correct it once they come back online. In addition, most modern transport layer protocols like Quick categorize their packets as UDP and build on top of it the reliability and congestion management features of TCP, as most older routers only recognize TCP and UDP packets. The benefit to this approach is to be able to pick and choose which features and associated overhead costs your transport layer protocol requires instead of choosing an out-of-the-box solution like TCP that has everything.